Miss Quay, welcome to Q. Ah, thanks for having me. How are you? I'm good. How are you? So, how are you feeling? Feel good. You're about to you 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 finally put this thing out. Finally. How long did you work on it for? Um, for a couple of years. It's actually been sitting in my pocket though, finished for about a year and a half. So, how does it feel to finally get it out there? It's it's good. It's gone. It's 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 out there. It's um, I think it was a bit of a thorn for a while. What do you mean? Well, because it's it's been finished, and you know when you finish something and you're holding on to it. it adds a weight it are, you know like it's already a pretty weighted album yeah. for me so to hold on to it and not um get that sense of relief from releasing it was a lot to carry for a while though i think about that sometimes because i do a, mm -hmm. i do a daily radio show yeah. and, and so therefore when it's done i can forget about it yeah and move on to the next thing i have to do whereas friends of mine who work on like weekly radio shows it's like it's all encompassing and then it's very nerve-wracking yeah to put it out. Did, did, did you find that the longer you were waiting on it the scarier it was to put it out? yeah the anticipation of it and then also it's you know because it's so personal as i think a lot of artists feel when you do finally release something you're like Ooh. so it's just a whole different type of nerves and and feeling well let's talk the feelings let's talk a little bit about personal your last album is also very personal very yeah. introspective this new one's called the fight within you have said it's about the self and where self fits into community particularly indigenous yeah. communities well what got you thinking about all that um well the first the first thing like the first shift that i had was actually when i went so my family's from winnipeg i was born and raised from treaty one and um one summer when I went home, we lost one of our young community members, and she she was 15 years old, and her name was T or is Tina Fontaine, and it really hit me in a in a different way. It was sort of like that tipping point moment where I you know obviously I was aware of the fact that um, we have this problem in Canada, w you know uh, where Indigenous women have been going missing and or being killed at an exponentially higher rate than any other demographic and are more likely to experience violence than any other demographic. Uh, but for some reason, this one, it really, um, it just got inside my bones in mm -hmm. a different way. And and it all sort of started there where where I, I watched as my community gathered together. Um, so one thing about Winnipeg, for those who might not know, is the city is built up around two rivers, the Red and the Assiniboine. And at the, the spot where the two rivers intersect, we have a, uh, an area, a market, but an also an, an area called the Forks, which, was like tradi which is traditional territory. Mm -hmm. And we have a monument for our missing and murdered women at this um, spot, this area in the Forks, mm -hmm. or at the Forks. And so when Tina's body was found, they found her just, she was found in the river and just outside of, of the forks, right? And so we, there were thousands of us that went down there and had a memorial for, for Tina. And from that spot walked down, port down through Portage and Maine to the forks. Port and then Portage and Maine being kind of the main intersection in, exactly. in, in Winnipeg. Yeah. yeah, and we were thousands yeah. strong walking. Yeah. And the thing that I real like when I looked out, I saw that it was... Um, it was a f reflection of Winnipeg. And Winnipeg is a predominantly, or not predominantly, but there are more indigenous people in Winnipeg per capita than anywhere else in Canada. Um, it is has been voted the most racist place in Canada, but at the same time, and that being directed towards indigenous people, mm -hmm. or uh, centered on at. Um, but the thing that I noticed when I was looking out into the crowd of people standing and coming together for Tina and for our missing and murdered women was that it was reflective of the community in as a whole. Mm -hmm. So it was Winnipeg that was there. There were, you know, people from different cultural backgrounds, people from, you know, men, women, children, grandparents, like everybody was there. And that's that even though I was feeling this massive sense of loss, uh, you know, and I didn't know Tina personally, but there's, you know, other reasons why it, it impacts so hard. Yeah, I mean, I, um, think, I, think, I think her death, I think her death for a lot of people, especially indigenous people, was really, was really impactful. It was a real, yeah. it was a real, for whatever seemed like a, a much needed watershed. I remember, I remember yeah. after Tina Fontaine's murder, there was the hashtag Am I Next? Am I Next? Yeah, that was absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's giving me shivers now. Like, I think my, I have, I have a two year old niece who's growing up brown in Winnipeg. And, you know, it, it, I, um, I want to be a part of of change in the best way that I can, so that you know she doesn't need to think about this hashtag. Am I next? Right. Right. So how how do you how do you go from that experience at that march? Mm -hmm. How do you go from processing these feelings that you had, and actually sit down and 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 make music from them? Is is that challenging? No. In that moment, it was just sheer grief that came out. So the 
the song that I wrote, you know, like I, I literally came home from that march and sat down at my keyboard and wrote uh, the song, cal- which is called Will I See, mm-hmm. which is on this record, and um, which is a much sadder space that I was in, right? Like I was in a, f- a, s- a state of, you know, loss and sadness and, you know, in the grief cycle, in that stage of, of the grief cycle. And it just came out like it was, uh, you know, I wrote that song in probably under 10 minutes. Um, and, you know, and then it's it was interesting because it was it became a process like over the, the couple of years, I started realizing that once your eyes are open to something, you can't close them again. Right. Like once you're once you're aware, it's, it's hard yeah. to ever you know go back. And I, I don't want to go back. Right. That's not the point that I'm trying to say is. But it's it's this idea that during that time. Um, yeah, it just became, it became what I did. It became my conversation. It became my, my goal to reach new people with these chats and not in a way where I, you know, like I never want it to, to be something that is alienating another person, right? Like my goal is not to make somebody feel different or, you know, my goal is not to make somebody feel, um, ashamed or anything like that my goal is you know if somebody feels uncomfortable i think that's okay because you know uncomfort leads to change right when something makes you uncomfortable we need to have discomfort in order in order to change discomfort there's a word yeah and and i think i think that I think that uh, we had a, f- a great mu- musician on recently named Rostam Bet Monglich, and he said something really interesting. He said that the reason um, he makes the music he makes is because music has an, uh, an ability to bypass the brain and just kind of go right to the central nervous system. Totally. So you can't even really think about it. Yeah. You just, you just kind of feel the message. Yeah, more than yeah. Else. You know what I mean? And it resonates with people differently, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, when when... I've I've taken songs like Will I See into classrooms. So one of the things that I do from time to time is I go into classrooms and I teach art-based workshops that are culturally rooted, right? To have these ki- kinds of conversations in you know, in high schools and junior high and and those sorts of things. And I we create a project that is, you know, surrounding music and involves lyrics and involves uh visual arts and these sorts of things mm-hmm. as a way for students to express themselves but also for them to interpret what what these conversations mean to them individually. Because the thing is, when you go, and this is one thing that I learned from going into these classes and working with students, is where, that... Like, where around were you going to these classrooms? Um, in Ontario. In Ontario. Yeah, right. so I've I've been to the many within the TDSB and Peel District. and Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I was able to learn from the students was that, you know, while this is reality here in Canada, Canada is, you know, a nation of people from many many different places right we have original people from this territory and then everybody else is from somewhere else Mm -hmm. and people are coming from new places all the time and that's one of the things that makes canada a great place is that you know people are welcome and and are joining this country every single day and they're having these students these youth these young people are coming in from other places where they're experiencing similar things as well because the thing is that the treatment of women is not um you know, it's it's, uh, you know, it's something that you know, based on or how to say this, like even when we look at this Me Too hashtag that's going around right now, yeah, right, it's clearly a, a problem that is an epidemic everywhere. It's not just Indigenous people in Canada. This is a big problem because we're the the um, the highest impacted community, right? Yeah, of course. But in terms of globally, women are experiencing these sorts of things elsewhere as well, Fair, yeah. right? So. So to have these chats with young people coming in from different countries and even uh, young people whose family come from different countries or whatnot and recognizing that these sorts of scenarios are um, relatable, even if they're not the same, but they're relatable. Like I was I was floored by that. Not that I, again, not that you don't, you don't know this, but like firsthand chats with, you know, 14 year olds who can relate to that level of violence is pretty... Um, humbling i guess yeah it's almost hard to know what word to use here. yeah because I, I i found myself saying shocked but i, I guess i no. wasn't shocked floored is a good word for it because yeah. you, it's something you know that's happening but still it's 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 disheartened uh, just very disheartened you credit your your stepfather for giving you a musical ear right um yeah i wouldn't call him my stepfather though okay what, ju- what yeah. would you prefer well he I, my dad right yeah he i grew up with him he's my dad right he adopted me when i was two mm-hmm. he started dating my mom when she was pregnant That's so he yeah so you've known him you've known him he's my dad yeah so how did you, your dad introduce you to music in some way absolutely he has a very eclectic 
interest in music. And I always say that at any given moment, you know, in his CD changer, Mm -hmm. because remember those things, those five disc changers, he would have, you know, Skinny Puppy to Mahalia Jackson to Hank Williams, junior and senior. You know, like it was, the spectrum was really broad. Even junior? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. I can dig senior. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know if I can dig junior. Hey, listen. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And... Oh, whoops, sorry oh, about that. That's okay. That's all right. And he ne- they never censored what I listened to. So, you know, I remember I have this I re- one memory in particular when I was about 12 and I was in my bedroom and I was listening to Easy E and I was cranking it pretty hard. Yeah. And <laughs> my si- my sister was 12 or my sister was 6 and my dad came in the room and he was like, you know, he was upset, right? Cuz it was Easy E and I'm 12. Yeah. However, he was like just passed me a pair of headphones and was like, you know, your sister's too young for this. So he didn't censor me and he wasn't censoring her because in the sense that um, had she wanted to listen to it, he would have let her. It's just that she wasn't making that choice. Right. So he wanted us to be able to make the choice of what we listen to based on our own wants and whatnot. Is, and he, st- is he still with us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, how's, yeah. how's he doing? He's good. Good. Yeah, he did. Um, the if you purchase the or see the my CD, he uh, does the inside art of it. How'd that come about? He, well, he's a visual artist. Yeah, yeah, and he's awesome. He's really really interesting. So the first album, what he worked with Crayola fine tip markers, and <laughs> 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 and it's actually a salmon steak. There's a salmon steak, and then there's a. a picture of my face but from a photograph and it's all like in pointillism so he on this one he even though he was using crayola felt or fine tip markers it was in pointillism and so there's a salmon steak and a face and our cat alice is on it too she gets a credit and then um on this record it's a charcoal piece that he did a million years ago and it's it's a, a grass dancer and it has the the it's a young grass dancer who um, barely has a face and the the story of this was you know kind of 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 um finding strength in a culture that was at one point fading and dying and, mm. and how we are bringing that back oh i wanted to get to that because uh, i want to talk about your mom too your yeah mom, your mom is korean metis yeah um she played a pretty central role in your upbringing absolutely what about what about her influence on you as an artist it may not be as as direct as they yeah. letting you listen to Easy E, but I'm sure it's there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, my mom, my mom. Hi, mommy. Um, <laughs> she's she's a tough lady, and and she really encouraged me to be strong and to speak out on things that I felt passionate about. What did she do for a living? Um, she. That's a good question. She teaches a healthcare. Oh no, that's what she was doing before. Now she's working in a old folks home. Cool. Yeah. It's good work. Yeah. So yeah. she's um, a nurse. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's fine. Um, and yeah, she's, you know, she she really encouraged me to stand up for things that I believe in, to think about what I want to say and to be, you know, steadfast in, in what I decide and, and those sorts of things. And so I attribute, um, I attribute any of my strength to her because she's, she's a, firecracker she's also a scorpio don't mess with her i won't yeah i won't i'm a taurus i don't know what, th- what does that mean about me uh you're a bull oh no yeah a little bit stubborn oh 100 percent. yeah 100%. <laughs> um I, I should mention since this is a radio show you're korean metis but you also have fair skin yes. you have blue eyes yes and you've been you've been open in the past about the privilege that your that your physical features have have given you yeah what's that been like grappling with with who you are mm-hmm. with sometimes who often people may perceive you to be yeah, it's it's been an evolution. It's had many faces. When I was a kid, um, I didn't realize that that was how it was. I didn't realize that I looked differently. I didn't care. You know, like when you're a kid, you're not paying attention. Well, I didn't have to pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, when did you realize it? When I was a teenager, I went to this one school. So I grew up in Winnipeg, and there's there you know, there's a lot of a lot of battles between, or you know, anyways, there's have been and were battles between native people and non-native people and i went to this one school in particular that that battle was pretty strong and at one point um because i've never been shy about what my background is and at one point there was like a group of kids that i guess found out quote unquote that i was indigenous and so at one point and it was a grade 7 to 12 school so it was you know you had older kids there and one point one of the older kids had written on my locker 
something not very nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and you had this realization that... I was like, oh, this is a thing. And then I had friends who weren't allowed to come to my house because I lived in the bad neighborhood, even though it wasn't a bad neighborhood. Of but, course. Yeah. You know, like things like that, that all of a sudden... And I didn't realize that, right? Like, I went home and I was telling my mom and she was just, you know, she would just sort of like roll her eyes mm -hmm. at, you know, like at these other people, not... Mm -hmm. But uh, and this is something this is something you've had to you've had to grapple with as an artist as, or just as a, as a person. Yeah, because it's you know it's it's one thing to um, it's one thing to identify so strongly like I d identify so strongly with this part of my background right like and it's because it's it's the people who are around me when I was growing up my my influential people um, they're, they're you know I grew up proud I I grew up feeling a, s a sense of strength and and whatnot and then once you start to realize that oh well your skin color is different than you know like what I might be thinking on the inside or feeling on the inside I, I kind of had this two party or not two party like this two streams for it where I wasn't brown enough to be brown but I wasn't white enough to be white right and so that was just like any mixed kid I think that's a common theme that comes up where it's like well where do you fit in and you you walk in these two worlds and finding your footing while walking in these two worlds and for a long time I felt a lot of um I felt sadness or I felt like you know like an oddball that just didn't fit in in either which way and and then I eventually learned how to channel that into something that that worked right where I realized that Number one, it is a privilege in, you know, in the sense of um, when we think of, of white skin and, and brown skin and, and how that fits on the privilege spectrum, yeah. right? So I recognize that. I'm not in any way um, delusional to, to thinking that I don't walk with that privilege every day. And then I started to think, well, how can I make this work in, in my favor for the community, right? Like... How, do, how can I think beyond myself in this? And I realized that, you know, I had this sort of sneak attack thing that I could pull where I found myself in rooms where people didn't, uh, you know, if they didn't know me, they didn't know what my background was and they would be talking trash and I'd just be like, listen, let's let's change this conversation right now. Really? And be so able so to people because they, they would look at you and not think that you're an indigenous person. Exactly. They would be having anti-indigenous or, or some kind totally. of callous conversations around you. Absolutely. And that was my high school experience. And so it was learning how to, uh, f you know, that's where I learned to be tough about it, where I learned to be like, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to let you get away with saying that we're going to have a chat about it right now. And I also learned how to approach the conversation in a way that I feel is um, going to have the most impact. Right. Mm -hmm. Like just r ripping into somebody isn't going to leave them walking away with any sort of, you know, positive change. It's just, you know going to get them to dislike me yeah. right so it was trying to f find a calculated way to I in those moments shift the conversation and shift the education so that people have a better sense of what's what they're saying and what it what weight it carries if you don't mind me asking how, how do you do that like well, what do you what, what do you say instead i have a conversation i yeah. you know like i, I why why would you say that do you know? yeah and then when when folks and because the I find that for the most part, it comes down to people just not knowing, right? Like you do have people who are, you know, ignorant and carry yuck in their heart yeah, hate, and yeah. hate in their heart. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's not changeable necessarily. That's something that's going on for them and they're going to have to deal with that and find their way out of it. Yeah. But I find that a lot of the time it is just a lack of understanding and that creates this divide, which creates this lack of sensitivity and lack of, you know, knowledge i guess right so it w you know the way i do it is is ask questions back like why do you think this is happening and and then once they start to answer these questions be like actually no that's not the truth this is the truth and if you want you know more proof about this this is where you can find mm -hmm. that out mm -hmm. you can even start you can even see their mind starting to change as they ask exactly the questions. you know like this co the common thing about taxes you know like that's the number one that oh, native that people don't native people don't pay any taxes. no native people don't pay taxes and i'm like well I pay taxes. I even paid a land transfer tax when I bought my house, mm -hmm. right? Like, go figure, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we pay taxes. There are there are situations where, uh, anyways, that's a whole different can of worms. But, but there, 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 there are a number of very, very, I mean, even that I grew up with, yeah. a number of very, very ignorant exactly. um, uh, assumptions to be made. But you're right, yeah. if no one actually tells them the assumptions are wrong. Where are we, where are we getting this education, right. right? You walk into the school systems and 
you know, there's been a big shift and that's awesome. And, you know, it's, it's everybody's sort of job to play a part of raising that awareness. Um, it's funny you mentioned impact. I just want to mm -hmm. close off like this before you hear another song. Yeah. Um, it's it's a really interesting time for indigenous musicians right now in this country, especially yeah. ar ar around impact. You look at people like Tanya Tagak and A Tribe Called Red and totally. Lilo, Lilo Pimienta, um, really making excellent music, yeah. excellent music, yeah, yeah. And, and moving moving consciousness forward, I, I think, yeah. as well. So what, what are you hoping Fight From Within adds to this conversation? <laughs> just that it adds to the conversation. You know, I think that... Um, in this moment, it's 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 interesting to be on this side of the fence right now. What do you mean? Right, like to be an indigenous person who is making music is different than how it felt five years ago. How so? Um, well, we're cooler now than we were before. Yeah. Right, like uh, in terms of mainstream culture, in terms of mainstream accessibility and acceptance, that's not something that we were a part of for the longest time, and. I've all, you know, I've I've maintained this this idea of being an artist who is indigenous as opposed to being an indigenous artist because I found the the latter would put me in this box that was w easily easily kind of thrown off to the side, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. we were forever like, you know, trying to push op open the lid and never really getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. So now to see, tri you know, as an example, tribe called Red with their f their Juno win, their first Juno win being a mainstream category and being the first indigenous act to win th that mainstream category it's it's a big deal like these you know buffy um tanya and Lido winning the polaris you know almost three years in a row like these are these are huge things and it's it's this acceptance right so it's it's interesting to be a part of it now where i'm not feeling in like i'm in that box anymore you cover a lot of ground of this album. You sing about missing Indigenous women, missing murdered Indigenous women, the environment as it relates to the health of Indigenous communities, um, healers inspired by the new generation of Indigenous youth coming up, and a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff we talked about. Yeah. Um, if there's one, and this is always a hard question to ask, because I, yeah. I don't really think that people make art like this. Right. I don't really think they make art like this, but I find once the album is actually made, maybe you have some perspective on it. I often okay. say you might think about this stuff when the plane's landing, right. and you're not allowed <laughs> to use your phone. Yeah, yeah. If there's one message if someone listens to this record uh, uh, and even like a young person listens to this record they get yeah. to the end of it they they end it on their phone yeah w any questions you'd like them to be asking themselves anything you'd like them to be thinking about as they listen to it oh i know it's not really uh, how you it's not really how you make that's art a really i know good question yeah. um how they would is, is, w ask the question again how they f i mean is there anything you, you is there any one particular message or question or just something that when it's over would, yeah. would lodge in their brain and, and they'd take with them for the rest of the day? I think it would, it would have to be how, how can we be a part of the change we want to see? Whether it's in the self, in the community, uh, and, you know, and, and progressively bigger and bigger placement. But how can you be a part of that change? How can we all, you know, make sure that we are doing our best to make things better for the, the ones that come up after us. That's great. Thanks for coming in. Oh, thanks for having me.